Change Your Life Through Love by Stella Terrell Mann. Light. I had followed many lights, will-o'-the-wisps and foxfires, restless stars and meteors and phosphorus of desires, lamp in the window, fire on the hill, lights by the sea in the night's chill, stars in the dusk all failed. Stars dimmed when dawn paled, oil burned low in the window's lamp, fires quenched in the fog's damp, lights by the sea were massed by cloud, hope entombed in fear's shroud. Where could I find the guiding light? Not in fires that flamed at night, not in stars or the sky's span, not in lanterns fueled by man. I was stumbling. I was lost in sorrow's smoking holocaust. Perhaps I prayed. It might be so. I heard a voice. Be still and know. I stilled my voice, stilled my brain, stilled my heart's insistent pain. I was still as primal night, knowing, knowing there is light. In my heart, a white glowing, light beyond the eyes knowing, warmed and flamed and brightly spread, lighting up the road ahead, road ahead and every side, radiance intensified, light, light. I shall never fear the night. By Don Blanding. Preface. Dear reader, are you entirely satisfied with your life as it is? Are there changes you'd like to make? Would you change grief to joy, worry and fear to peace of mind and body, failure in any part of your life and affairs to glorious and successful living? And are you soul sick of a way out of life that drenches the world in blood every few years? Do you fear for the future of the human race in this atomic age? If you are not satisfied with things as they are, then this book was written for you. Its purpose is to tell you how to change things by learning spiritual laws and how to work with them. Its special purpose is to show you what love is and how to draw it into your life and how to use it for what it is, the greatest power known to man and the highest of all spiritual laws. Please understand that I do not set myself up as a teacher of the spiritual laws, for I know very little. My authority to speak on this subject comes from the fact that my whole life has been changed by applying the little I do know. Having caught a glimpse of the light, I yearn to point the way of light to others. To help to raise the level of the moral consciousness of mankind has become the purpose of my life. In order to share what I have learned and used in my own life, I have for years served as a counselor to people with problems. How we solve those problems by working with spiritual laws has become the subject matter of my lectures and of my published works. This book, in the second of a series designed to help others understand and apply the spiritual laws which we have used with such good results. Lives are changed for the better by learning and using many parts of the law. For law, as Blackstone said, is a rule of action. Webster says law is, among other things, the will of God, whether expressed in scripture, implanted in instinct, or deduced by reason. The more we learn and use this law, the more easily does an abundant and joyous life materialize. But all we can hope to do in one book is to stress one tenet of the law so that the reader may better understand how to work with that particular part in his own affairs. In the first book of this series, Change Your Life Through Prayer, my purpose was to define prayer 
and demonstrate its use in soul growth and the solution of everyday problems. It included several case histories of people with whom I had worked in prayer. In that book, we considered Jesus' statement that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. And we found it to be pure truth, a part of the total law or will of God. We saw that these words guaranteed the reality of prayer, and we learned how to use that power to solve personal problems. The casual reader need not go through that first book in order to get the most out of this one, but the serious student intent on changing his life for the better will find it worthwhile to do so. For prayer, an earnest attempt to communicate with the infinite spirit of the universe, which we commonly call God, still is the first step in changing lives and solving problems. It is an instrument to be used with the second step outlined here. Of course, the reader may know a great deal more about prayer than the writer. Those who have a method that works should by all means use it. But those who feel they have not been very successful with their prayers will, I believe, find considerable help in that first book. In all the ages and places, a few men have recognized spiritual laws and worked with them. But the great mass has remained unaware of them. A great many church-going, Bible-reading people of today seem to overlook the hidden or real meaning of some of the most significant of Christ Jesus' teachings. If this fact were not true, their lives would be much happier and far more successful than many of them are. This is not criticism. It is an opinion based upon sympathetic observation in working with many such cases. These good people, like Job, have heard of the law with the ear, but have not learned how to use it with the heart. It is not easy to learn, as I early discovered when I first set out to change my own life through prayer and love. I could not see why I had to suffer. Wasn't I a good Christian? Wasn't I a good Methodist? Well then, God, why do you let these things happen to me, if you love me? I cried as Job had done. But like Job, I lived to learn that ignorance of the law excuses no one, and having learned the law and put it to use, I received from God more than I had in the beginning. To discover the laws, the true facts of the universe always has been the most serious work of mankind. This search early branched off into distinct streams, one we call science and the other philosophy, which of course includes religion. Science has tried to find the fixed laws. Religion has looked for the will of God. The followers of each branch have been pretty sure, and sometimes violently sure, that the other branch was the wrong channel in which to find a better way of life for all men. Science gives us facts or knowledge. Religion gives us wisdom. Science tells us how to create the atomic bomb. Religion tells us what we had better do with the bomb once it had been created. Science records all the facts which man has discovered in his physical environment and defines the world in materialistic terms. Religion tells us what is at work in man which drives him to make such an inquiry and declares the real world to be the unseen or spiritual one. For nearly 300 years, science has talked people out of their belief in God by presenting a purely materialistic universe. The trouble is, scientists are mere human beings and so make mistakes. That fact should give us no quarrel with science, for it is a search for truth and therefore prayer. Science makes an earnest attempt to communicate with the infinite spirit of the universe. It asks questions of God and experts' answers. Though some Orthodox scientists shudder at the term and seem to prefer anti-chance if they must mention a cause at all. Our great Orthodox Church leaders are also mere human beings and make mistakes which drive people away from churches and from the knowledge of God.
They are sometimes so filled with theology that they have lost their religion. Our churches have become so cluttered with creed, custom, rites, precedent, and little church quarrels about the letter of the law that they have quite forgotten or neglected to live the spirit of it. It is an old human failing. Jesus complained about it in his day. But all this gives us no quarrel with the church, nor with the faithful who hold it together. We still have a duty as individuals to see that our church keeps step with time, and if it does not, then the fault is also ours. Falling between the apparent contradictions presented by these two branches of the laws, many people lost faith in their old conception of God and found no new one to take its place. So they gave up all religion and suffered accordingly. Their children and grandchildren after them now show the results, among which is our terribly high rate of mental illness. One of the purposes of this book is to aid people in rediscovering God and to rebuild a faith in the help that may be had for the asking. The long quarrel between our two great branches of learning is coming to a close at last in our day. The wide gulf between them, which was but an imaginary one in the first place, is being bridged, thanks to the untiring, honest, and often brave efforts on both sides. It is entirely possible that science will yet prove that existence of God and of spiritual laws to a greater number of people than religion has been able to do. At present, religion accepts the existence of God. Its followers have arrived at that conclusion through an inner wisdom and a personal experience which they know in their hearts need not be explained, but which for the sake of others they try to articulate. Science is busy explaining and is coming to the conclusion that God exists. This God is one and the same God. These seekers of truth have been climbing the same mountain from opposite sides. They are now getting near enough to the top to see the same peak. Both sides are now about ready to admit that fact and all the world may well rejoice. To the reader interested in following this trend toward agreement between science and religion, I strongly recommend the study of two recent books. They are Human Destiny by the brilliant French scientist Le Comte du Nuit, a book that will help you find God and a faith in the future if you have not already found Him, and one that will help you to understand yourself, your fellow man, and all life. Study it. We shall not outgrow it in our lifetime. The other book is Man Does Not Stand Alone by Cressy Morrison, an American scientist. His book seeks to prove the existence of God by showing his provisions for man and by presenting living evidence of his theories. No one interested in increasing his faith in God's love and care of man should miss it. I also recommend reading Reach of the Mind by Dr. J.B. Ryan, director of the Parapsychology Laboratory of Duke University. This book tells about the extrasensory and psychokinesis tests that have been carried on for the past 20 years at the university. Not all who read Ryan's book will accept his findings as proof that man does have the power within himself to influence things to happen in the way he wants them to happen merely by use of his mind. While I accept Dr. Ryan's findings as proof of the existence of certain spiritual laws, it is my opinion that not much more progress can be made in this field until the purpose and method are put on a higher level. There is nothing new in these findings, nothing unknown to religion. They are on the right track, for man does have the power within himself to create, to change, to control his world, and to get what he desires of life by using his mind in a certain way. Prayer is a reality. The Duke University experiments are of tremendous importance because in them, science is about to say that God could exist even though we're not able to see, hear, taste, touch, or even smell Him. It is about to admit the possibility that another world other than the physical, materialistic one exists. Those experiments are attempts to contact 
and to work with the forces or the rules of action, the laws of the world Jesus Christ knew so well. The testers, in trying to prove that the fall of cards and of dice can be controlled and foretold by desire, are trying to prove the power of prayer whether they realize it or not. To talk about prayer is to admit the existence of God. They are working with prayer all right, but they are overlooking the most important tenet of that law. Purpose. The desire is the power, just as Jesus Christ taught. The word and the thought are merely used to express or carry it. Faith is also a part of the law, but back of these is the most important element of all. Purpose. To some readers, using a power of the mind, desire to influence the fall of a card may seem a far cry and even a sacrilegious one from using it to predict a harvest months before it is due, or to heal a leper. But to me, the same power and principle, or law, are involved, the only real difference being one of degree and purpose. Just as we may use the power of electricity to warm a room or to electrocute a criminal, we may use the law of desire for trivial or for holy purposes. And as we shall see as we go along with our studies, it makes no difference to the law of desire how it is used any more than it makes any difference to the law of electricity whether it is used to save a life or to take one. Having free will and the ability to set this force into motion, man uses it quite as readily to his harm as he does for his good. And while it makes no difference to the force itself, it does make a difference to God for what purpose a man uses this force. It makes a difference to man. 2. The difference between life and death. The Duke University testers are, whether they realize the fact or not, trying to prove the existence of a law which Jesus started in the following words. Whatsoever things ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. From the book of Mark, chapter 11, verse 24. But Jesus did more than state the law. He repeatedly warned that we dare not set it into motion except for certain purposes within the law of love. And he explained what happens when we do set it into motion outside this, the highest law of the universe, the ultimate tenet of God's will. The Bible tells us that before we ask, our necessity will be met for it's already revealed. We surely need to know how to use this awe-inspiring power of creating by desire, asking, and belief. We surely need to know how to handle it far more than we need to know how to handle electricity, for example. Nearly 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ met that need by telling us how we must use this law or be destroyed by our own efforts in misusing it. We have not heeded Christ's warning, and so today there are more people afraid of the future of man than there ever were before at one time in the history of the world. They fear that we have let our machines dominate us, that we lack the necessary moral force, love, to control our material, scientific creations. Anything, therefore, that science can do to prove that we have this power at our disposal is of tremendous importance for the whole human race. The next step will be to heed the warning about its correct use. We must learn to use it for our good instead of using it for our greed and evil or be destroyed by our own efforts. Jesus' mission on earth was to show man both how to obtain a more abundant life by learning to use the spiritual forces according to their laws or nature, and at the same time, how to use them within the nature of the highest law, the law of love. Science has long served mankind in that same capacity by learning the material or physical laws, but they seem to have entirely overlooked the highest law. Lack of knowledge of the spiritual laws and failure to work within the highest of them, love, has therefore defeated man the world over in his efforts to reap the benefit 
of the creations of material science. Thus, we see ten bushels of wheat grown where two grew before, only to be destroyed to sustain prices while half the world goes hungry. What if the hungry should decide to exterminate those who have wheat? Is there danger of their joining forces with a world power, which for evil reasons of its own promises to divide the wheat among all the hungry in exchange for armed allegiance? Will the hungry give up freedom for bread? Or will they learn how to use their freedom and the spiritual laws of their disposal to provide bread? And who shall teach them in time? Shall we use atomic power to create a better way of life than any civilization ever has known? Or shall we destroy all mankind? How can we be freed from the threats of extermination of the human race? Jesus announced that if anyone would believe in and apply the truths he taught, those truths would set them free. Truth, says Webster, means real state of things, fact, reality, a true statement or proposition, an established principle, fixed law. Jesus' whole ministry was one of proving that man has within himself a power that rightly used will heal, prosper, guide, lead him onto eternal life. Learning how to use that power should be the biggest business of our lives, for when wrongly used, it leads to failure, tragedy, sickness, poverty, death, and finally, utter destruction. Merely hearing about the power will not save us or change our lives. Not all who say, Lord, Lord, won't be saved, but only those who doeth the will of my Father. We must use this power. And we must use it in a spiritually legal manner, that is, according to God's highest will, or within the law of love, all good for all. No one but a fool or a madman would attempt to work against the highest spiritual law, God's will, if he understood what he was doing. Once we get a glimpse of this highest law and watch it working inexorably time after time, increased knowledge of the law of love will become the most important thing in our lives. For by right use of it, we can obtain the good desires of our heart, and by wrong use of it, lose all we have ever held dear, including our own soul. In the largest sense, there are not laws, but a wholeness, God's reality, law, perfection of being. Our little finite minds, however, cannot possibly cope with so stupendous a whole. We must break it up into parts and call it the laws, the total of which is the light. Catching a glimpse of the light is, I believe, what happens in all true conversations. The penitent or seeking soul sees a fact, an established principle. Suddenly he understands something beyond a doubt. The great mystics have told us of their experience in catching a gleam of the light. I do not for a second compare my small findings with their great ones. But I have had enough experience with the flash of light, which is as near as I can come to describing it, to know what the mystics were talking about and that they reported truly. The light can come to anyone. There is no need for either intercession or guidance, but it comes only to those who have made preparation to receive it. We cannot learn what we are not prepared to learn. Desire to learn is the first necessity. When Paul saw the light, he was with others on Damascus Road who also saw a light, but were not blinded. They heard no voice, did not understand. Yet Paul saw so much and heard so much that it changed his life completely, for he understood. He turned from persecuting to loving and leading. He had believed in force as a power and the letter of the law. Now he learned that love is the greatest power in the world, above even the power of thought, and that thought and desire, until brought under love, are dangerous. When we study his life, we realize Paul was prepared to receive the truth, even though he had been searching for it in the wrong direction. A lifetime would not be long enough in which to examine fully the truth in the teachings of Christ Jesus. And the most we can do in one book 
is to take one little part of one spiritual law and study it in action and try to apply it in our lives. That is the purpose of this book, to look at the working of the highest of all spiritual laws, the law of love. A number of case histories of people with problems that were solved by learning and using the law are included in the book so that the reader may see how to use the law in his own life or to solve his own problems. And this book should not leave you where it finds you. Its purpose is to show you how to change things. If you will take it up with an air of happy expectancy, you will help to quicken your mind and so get the greatest possible benefits from it. As you read, listen to your own still small voice. For nothing I have said here is one half so important nor half so revealing as that which will happen in your own mind if you will invite it and encourage it to happen. There is a part of your consciousness that is connected with the mind of God. And this book can show you nothing new in life or love, or the laws. It can only stimulate you, quicken you to remembering something you have known since before Abraham was, and convince you that you should put that knowledge to work now. Although I have worked on this book for several years and discarded several times the amount of material it contains and have completely rewritten it more than 20 times, I still am not satisfied with it and must beg the reader's indulgence with its faults. Perhaps it is impossible to say exactly what one desires to say, but it does give some relief to attempt to say it. May God bless your reading of these words. And now, come, my brother, my sister, and let us talk about love. Let us first learn what it has done for others, then learn what it really is, how it works, and finally, how to use it and trust it to change our lives from all that we do not like to all that we desire them to be. Los Angeles, September 1948. End of preface. I am Daisy, your hostess, and I invite you to join me at the next video as we begin this journey with this book and this author discovering how we can better our lives through love. Head over to my book playlist and let's go to the next video where we're going to learn the nature of love and how it works.